Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you guys, and good to be back up here. It's been a little bit since I've been here, and in fact, I had to go back and look, and the last Sunday school lesson I taught was in December, and it feels, <laughs> you know, it's really not that long ago, but it feels like forever ago, you know? Um, so it's good to be back up here, good to be back and getting into it again. Um, so... As you guys know, I've been teaching through the book of Ephesians in Sunday school, and we've been working our way through it slowly but surely, but it's, it's an amazing book. It really is, and full of so much depth that I think it's good to go through it slowly and just dwell on all of the riches and the truths that are here. Um, and we've, we've gone through chapter one and just that, that amazing chapter in which We're told that as believers, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, right? And and Paul unfolds the fact of how we've been chosen by God before the foundation of the world, how we've been adopted as sons, redeemed through the blood of Christ, lavished in his grace, sealed by the Spirit, Then he prays that we would just grow in our knowledge of these great truths. And then in chapter 2, he just goes on to unfold just the beauty of our salvation, how we were totally and utterly dead in our trespasses and sins. But yet God, in the richness of his mercy and his love, has made us alive. He saved us. He's made us his workmanship, which is his masterpiece. And then towards the end of chapter 2, Paul just unfolds the beauty of the fact of not only has he made us alive in Christ, but he has placed us into Christ's body as the church. And just the beautiful truth that this is, that now both Jews and Gentiles, these two groups that hated each other, hated each other with a hatred that we can't even comprehend, have been brought and united in one spirit with one Lord We've been unified into one body. We have been built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. As he closes in chapter 2. and Then in chapter 3, he's just unfolding more of this wonderful truth of the church and just this, this great mystery that the church was. And a mystery was something that was hidden, but was now revealed, right? The church was something that the Old Testament saints would have had no idea about, the blending of Jews and Gentiles together in one body. And so Paul is unfolding this this wonderful and beautiful mystery, and just kind of as a way of review, um, we'll pick it up in verse 6 as a way of review of chapter 3, talking of this this beautiful mystery, he says, now he's going to be specific. He's going to unfold what this mystery is. He says, in chapter 6, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, and then let's just keep reading, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ." Now, backing it back up to verse 6, the last time I taught, we kind of hit verse 6, but we'll just go over it again, again as kind of a way of review to get us going here. 
he says, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise that is in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This mystery is that the Gentiles were going to be saved and brought into the body of Christ. The Gentiles are going to be members of the body. This is amazing. But this is something we see, right, as we study through the Bible. Like we see this in Acts, right? In Acts chapter 11, you know, with the conversion of Cornelius. You know, Peter, right after that, is immediately questioned by the Jews, right? Because in their mind, how could the gospel message go out to the Gentiles? But in Acts chapter 11, verse 18, Peter, when he was talking to, or, you know, Peter had explained how God had worked to save Cornelius, and then the Jews, it says in verse 18, he says, when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. And then Paul and Barnabas, you know, on their first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, they were accustomed to going out to the synagogues and talking to the Jews first. But after being rejected by the Jews, they said in Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 46, he says, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, speaking of the Jews, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the, end of, to the end of the earth. So salvation was being brought to the Gentiles. Gentiles were being saved. And what would be the Gentiles' response to that? Well, in verse 48 of Acts 13, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. So again, going back to verse 6 here of chapter 3 in Ephesians, the Gentiles, the Gentiles are now fellow heirs of Christ fellow members of the body, which is to say they are part of the church. They, and they are fellow partakers of the promise which is in Jesus Christ, which is new life. Salvation has come to the Gentiles, and this rightly made the Gentiles rejoice, right? And folks, I hope when you read through those passages, it makes you rejoice as well. Because are we Jews? No. We are also Gentiles. So when we read through and we see how God has worked to bring the Gentiles into the church and to save them, that directly affects us and the fact that salvation is possible for us. That we are a part of the church united together in Christ Jews and Gentiles united together. Again, these two groups that absolutely hated each other are now totally and completely brought together in unison in the body of Christ. They're part of the church. They're part of the church. So really... Verse 7 now is where we're going to pick it up. That was kind of a way of review just to get us back into it because we hit that last time. 
But, what it, but it was for this purpose, he says again in verse 6, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, and here it is, verse 7, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power. He says it was for this purpose, to make the Gentiles fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, that Paul says he was made a minister for by God. And the word minister here, the word minister and I'm probably going to butcher this, it's diaconus. It's diaconus. And it means one who executes a command for a master. It was first used to mean of a servant who would wait on tables. And then later it just became, it just began to mean a servant in general. So when Paul says here that he was made a minister, He's clearly saying he was made a servant. Paul's saying he is a servant. He's a minister of Christ, sent to do the bidding of his master. And Paul's kind of unique in the fact that he was kind of told right from the beginning, right, what his, how he was going to be used by the Lord. Right, because what was Paul called to be a minister to? To the Gentiles, right? Acts chapter 9, verses 15, 16. He says, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. For my name's sake. Acts 26, verses 15 through 20. This is Paul speaking about himself here. He says, And I said, Lord, who are you? Or excuse me. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Get up, but get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you've seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. And then just one more Again, Paul speaking in Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, starting in verse 15. He says, But I have written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God, for I will not presume to speak anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed." Paul's ministry, for which he was made a minister, was to the Gentiles. 
And Paul was sent and empowered by God to be a minister of the gospel. Right? He said in verse 6, he says, And fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister. Colossians 1.23 he told the, the, the folks at, Coloss- at Colossae, he says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which is proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Colossians 1.25 Of this church... I was made a minister, which is again a servant, according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Paul was called to be a minister, to be a servant of the gospel specifically to the Gentiles, to carry out the gospel message to the world. And he says in verse 7, according to the gift of God's grace. God's grace. By using the word minister, Paul's already made it clear that he's nothing in and of himself. He's just a servant. That is fulfilling the task that he, has, that he was given to do by the master. But he wants to make it abundantly clear that this is all of God's grace. This is all of God's grace. God's abundant and unmerited favor that was given to Paul as a gift He didn't earn this calling. He didn't deserve this calling. God didn't have to call him. God didn't have to use him. God didn't have to save him. This was all by the gift of God's grace. God's grace. And this is something that Paul always gave acknowledgement to in his writings. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove in vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. Grace of God within me. Which gets us back to verse 7 here when he says, According to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Of his power. Not only was this all of God's grace, but this was all by God's power. All of this was by God's power. Again in Colossians, Colossians 1.29, Paul said, For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which works mightily within me. The power of God worked mightily in Paul, did it? Did it not? In fact, it's interesting because back in Ephesians chapter 1, as we were going through that, you know, when Paul began to pray his prayer for the people of Ephesus, he said in, in chapter 1, 19, he says, and he, before that he was saying he was wanting them to know more and more about God, and he says in verse 19, And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Paul wanted us to know. He wanted the believers 
to know the surpassing greatness of the power of God, right? Do you realize Paul's own life put God's power on display? God displayed his power simply by saving Paul, right? God's power was put on display when Paul was saved. But even in Paul's own ministry, God's power was displayed over and over and over again. Paul went out into the world armed only with the gospel. Armed only with the gospel. And he shared the gospel into the world, and it turned the world upside down. And the world was powerless to stop him. They couldn't stop it. The gospel message spread like wildfire. And the world couldn't stop it. Why? Paul was just a man, no different than you or I, right? But the world couldn't stop his message because it was protected and strengthened and used by the power of God. The power of God was put on display in Paul's life, and the power of God is in the lives of each and every believer. You when you are faithful to the call of the gospel, God empowers you, strengthens you, builds you up, equips you. No different than Paul. Paul was just a man the same as you and I, but God used him the same as he's using us. But again, even though the power of God was working in Paul, we still see this intense humility. He says in verse 8, He says, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Even though Paul had been used by God in many amazing ways, he always remained humble. Even in the verse, you know, in verse 7 that we just went through, we see Paul declaring that he's just a minister. He's just a servant. And that all of this was a gift of God's grace on his life. All of this was God's power working in him, not Paul's power. Paul went out of his way in humility, to make sure people understood he was just a man. He didn't deserve any glory or any honor. All of this was by God's work, not his. Which is why he calls himself the very least of all the saints. The phraseology Paul uses here when he says the very least of all the saints Paul is literally saying that he is less than the least of saints. Less than the least of saints. That's what he's saying. And these kind of statements were not unusual for Paul. We, we see these kind of statements in Paul's writings. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles. Not and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Second Corinthians twelve eleven, he says, I have become foolish. You yourselves compelled me. Actually, I should have been commended by you, for in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am a nobody. And that one's kind of an interesting context there because in that one, Paul's actually having to defend his ministry because his ministry come, has come under attack, come under fire by a lot of people that wanted to undermine him. And 
by doing that, if they were successful in that, they'd undermine the gospel message that he was teaching. So really almost rather reluctantly, he's having to defend himself and defend the gospel message that he's proclaiming. But even in the process of that, he says, I am a nobody. He says, even though I am a nobody. (laughs) So even in the midst of defending himself, he can't help but just put in that little statement to show really a, a, a true humility in the midst of that. 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. I am foremost of all. Paul, the foremost of sinners? It's a pretty bold statement. But you've got to understand, Paul was formerly Saul. Paul knew the scriptures better than anyone. He grew up in them, was raised in them. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was educated under Gamaliel, which was like the highest Jewish teacher of the day. He knew, Paul knew the scriptures frontwards and backwards. He, out of anyone, should have recognized the Messiah. But yet he didn't. He didn't. He, just the same as all of the other religious leaders of the day, rejected his own Messiah. Rejected him. And then on top of that, in his misguided zeal for God, he went out and he persecuted the church. He persecuted the body of Christ. He persecuted Christ's bride. He actively sought to destroy the bride of Christ. And he was active in that when God stopped him in his tracks and opened his eyes to the truth. And rightfully so, Paul never got over that. He persecuted Christ and yet Christ saved him. The knowledge of that kept Paul intensely humble throughout the rest of his life going above and beyond in his writings to make sure that God got every ounce of all the glory for literally everything that happened in Paul's life. Every good thing, everything that happened, it was all to the glory of God. Even as we've seen here again in verse 7, It was all by the gift of God's grace. It was all by the working of God's power. And again here in verse 8, he says, to me the very least of all the saints. Again, he can't help but throw this in there again. This grace was given. This grace was given. Here again, Paul is going out of his way to make it clear that this is all of God's grace. This is all by grace and grace alone. Paul didn't do anything to deserve any praise. So this grace was given to him, and why was it given to him? It says at the end of verse 8, to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. The unfathomable riches of Christ. What does unfathomable mean? Can't comprehend? Okay. In its literal sense, it just means to be unable to fathom. Fathom. 
And what does it mean to fathom something? Well, really, the, the word fathom, fathom, excuse me, the word fathom is a naval term. It was a naval term. And it was, it was used, it was a term that was used to measure the depth of water. Because naval vessels, especially as they're approaching the coast, kind of need to know what the depth of the water is, don't they? So they would measure that. And that was known as a fathom. And one fathom, does anyone know how long one fathom was? Six feet. One fathom was six feet. Here's another one for you. On the typical ship of Paul's day, how they, they would use a rope known as a lead line because it was a lead-weighted rope that would drop down off the front and then you'd have it marked every six feet, so every fathom, to, to judge depth. How long was that rope on average? Typical naval vessel that is usually 25 fathoms long. So for you math geniuses, that is 150 feet they could measure. We actually see an example of this back in Acts 27. I won't have you guys turn there. But Acts 27, you know, as Paul is on his way to Rome, you know, and the ship was adrift for many days, and the sailors started wondering if they were getting close to land, so they take a measurement. And the first time they measured, it was 20 fathoms, and then the next time they measured, it was only 15. So that's going from 120 feet to 90 feet. And so the sailors rightly figure out, well, we're, we're starting to head towards land. <laughs> you know? um, and so the ability to measure the depth of the seas was extremely useful to sailors, right? Because as they neared the coastlands, they needed to make sure they didn't run the ship aground. But let me ask you, that 150-foot that measuring line that they had, what good would that do them in the middle of the ocean? None. Zero. Because how deep is the ocean? Remember, their line is 150 feet. How deep is the ocean? By the best technology that we can measure with today, the ocean is 35,876 feet deep. It's a little bit longer than that 150-foot measuring line they have, right? In fact, you'd probably need like 240-plus of those. That's pretty deep. But guess what? In Paul's day, they had no idea how deep the ocean was. In Paul's day, the ocean just kept going and going and going and going. It was literally in the, Jew, in the day of Paul and with the Jews and pretty much everyone, the idea of the ocean was that it was just bottomless. You never found the bottom. It was completely unable to be measured, completely unable to be fathomed. It was unfathomable. And guess what? That is exactly the point that Paul is trying to make here. He is saying that no matter how hard you try, you will never be able to measure. You will never be able to plumb the depths of. You will never be able to fathom the riches of Christ. No matter how far you try to measure, no matter how long your lead line is, the riches of Christ run infinitely farther. Infinitely farther. Romans 11.33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how and unfathomable his ways. Unfathomable. The riches of Christ include 
all of his truths and all of his blessings. It is all that Christ is and has. It is everything that Paul has already been unfolding and explaining to the Ephesians in this letter. When Paul told us at the start of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1, 3, when he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, that all flows from the riches of Christ. In 2 Peter 1, 3, when we're told that seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, that flows from the riches of Christ. If the riches of Christ are unfathomable, which they absolutely are, then the things that we can fathom, the things that we can see, the truths that we can know from Scripture, all of these wonderful and amazing things, things that we bring us immense joy and comfort, all of these amazing blessings we have, these are just the fringes of the depth of the riches of Christ. Here's just some of the riches of Christ. These are just some of the riches that we as believers have been blessed with. God's kindness, tolerance, and patience. Romans 2, 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? His mercy and great love, Ephesians 2, 4. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. God's glory, Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. You realize that it is God that supplies us with all things to enjoy? 1 Timothy 6.17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. God's assurance, Colossians 2.2, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. How about simply God's word? When he says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. The riches of Christ would include everything we've already looked at in chapters 1 or 2 in Ephesians. The fact that we've been chosen by God, adopted as sons, freely lavished in God's grace, redeemed through his blood, sealed by the Spirit, made alive in Christ, given the gift of faith, made into God's masterpiece, placed in the body of Christ. All of these things and more, all of these truths All of these blessings, all that Christ is and has done, and all that Christ has are all part of the unfathomable riches of Christ. It's unfathomable. Scripture even tells us that the riches of Christ are so great that even the reproaches of Christ are worth far more than this world has to offer. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 26 says, by, the faith, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, 
choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. The riches of Christ are so unfathomable, so great, that even the reproaches of Christ are far and abundantly worth more than anything this world has to offer. And I had more, but we've ran over. But to sum it up with with this, that the riches of Christ are absolutely unfathomable. But as believers, as those who are covered in the blood of Christ, we are called to fathom the unfathomable. We are called to continually dig into this and to mine out the wealth of Scripture. We will never reach the bottom of it. That's why it's unfathomable. But you just keep digging and digging and digging, and it is through this that we are strengthened, that we are built up, that we are encouraged, that we're edified, that according to Colossians, that the man of God is made complete. All through the riches of Christ. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the truth of Scripture, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that the salvation, that salvation, the gospel message has gone out to the Gentiles, Lord. That Gentiles are part of the body and the bride of Christ. And Lord, we thank you for all of the immense riches of Christ that we do enjoy and are blessed with. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. And Lord, how truly unfathomable it is. And may we spend our lives trying to dig it up and to understand it and to know it, Lord. But the whole time always being amazed by you, Father. And we'll just thank you in Christ's name. Amen.